Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online in association with Minimally Invasive Spine Surgeons Association of Bharat to introduce today's topic and the speakers. I hand over to Dr. Sambosha. Thank you, Dr. Neeraj. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ms. Saab, for conducting this uh, seminar. Uh, every month, Ms. Saab is conducting various topics. Last month, we had uh, Destando's decompression. Um, and today, we are mainly going to talk about the interlaminar approach for discectomy and decompressions. Uh, we have esteemed panelists with us, a lot of stalwarts uh, who are uh, one of the top in their own techniques. We have uh, Dr. Pramod Lokande from Pune, who is fantastic with his full endoscopic work. Also, we have Dr. Arun Banot from Delhi, who does a lot of interlaminar as well as transferaminal full endoscopic. Uh, we also have Dr. Mohinder Kaushal, who is his stalwart for Destandu's technique. Uh, Dr. Ketan Deshpande from Pune, who is an expert with uh, UB techniques. And we also have Dr. Pradeep Sharma, Varun Agarwal, Ayush Sharma, who are all experts in their own way with regards to transferaminal as well as interlaminar. So we have a great panel here, a lot of discussions. Uh, we are going to start with uh, a case presentation as well as video techniques on interlaminar discectomy, followed by decompression. And then we have a few cases to discuss, and as well as two papers uh, will be discussed today. So uh, I will start with the first topic, which is. Uh, uh, full endoscopic interlaminar discectomy, uh, which will be presented by me. So <clears throat> I'll just share my screen. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'll straight away start off with the case uh, of 32 year old male, uh, right leg pain since six months, uh, no relief with conservative management. He had even taken a root block, which gave him relief for. A few days. Uh, SLR was positive. Uh, he, uh, the S1 um, myotome also was four out of five. Sensation uh, were reduced in the S1 dermatomes. Uh, and the MRI showed a huge L5 S1 uh, disc, uh, mainly on the right side, completely compressing the right S1 nerve root. Uh, so over here, I would just like to first start off asking our panelists, uh, Dr. Bano, Dr. Pradeep, if, uh, would you venture into a transforaminal endoscopic discectomy here, or would you prefer the interlaminar approach? Hello, Dr. Tarun? Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. So uh, do we have the x-ray for this patient? Yeah, so I don't have, have the intra-op image. I went in for interlaminar, but okay, this okay, is the intra-op so, image, which you can see earlier. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, anyway, uh, I just asked that question for the academic purpose. But these days, if you ask me, most of my L5 S1, especially the large one herniation, I choose interlaminar approach instead of the transferaminal one uh, for the sake of ease of surgery as well as the minimally invasive full endoscopic technique that we are able to do with the interlaminar. It is as good as doing a transferaminal. Of course, whenever there is a choice between transferaminal and interlaminar, when they are equally effective and safe, we would tend to choose the transferaminal. But at L5-S1, because in this case, you can see the disc is sunken into the pelvis, so it will require a sharp trajectory, which will create uh, some difficulty uh, for a moderately trained person. Some expert person may be able to do it, but for a moderately trained person, uh, it will not be that easy to do it and it will still be taking more time. So I'll definitely choose interlaminar for such a case. Dr. Pradeep Singh, would you also agree with it? You do a lot of yeah, transferaminal. Yeah, so, so. yeah I, uh, I agree with Arun what uh, is uh, saying. So I, I sometimes, you know, uh, used to treat such pathology with, you know, transiliac, you know, approach, yeah. transferaminal, transiliac approach, which is, I think, too much destructive uh, uh, for this, you know, if if we could do the, if we could reproduce the same result with interlaminar, I think that would be better choice in such situation. So uh, I think a lot of us would definitely. I mean, surgery is uh, going to be provided to this patient, and uh, Dr. Amit Sharma does uh, a lot of endoscopic decompression using the tubes. I think probably Dr. Mohinder Kaushal would use the Destandus technique for her. Uh, however. 
I've been trained with the interlaminar endoscopic approach uh, for this. And the first thing we usually do is obviously leading your MRI scan. So if you, there is a disc over here, there's a small piece also, which is compressing the right S1 nerve. And if you see that, that's at the interlaminar uh, junction, just up below the flavum. So the reason why I choose interlaminar in this case, because there's hardly any bony work, which is required usually at the interlaminar area, at L5 S1, especially because you have a very big interlaminar space. So if you see here, the L5 S1 level has the biggest interlaminar space and the interlaminar space gradually reduces uh, as we go up. So majority of the times you don't require any kind of uh, laminotomy, especially at the L5 S1 uh, levels. So, the, to start with the mainly the technique, uh, the patient is basically uh, put prone uh, in uh, as a regular uh, cases uh, on the bolsters, and we flex the table to increase the interlaminar space. So the positioning absolutely remains the same. Uh, majority of the techniques, whatever people use, uh, I think the position is not going to change. But so just one thing I would like to again reiterate about is the indications. So for me, uh, in fact, I was always more uh, inclined towards interlaminar approach. I started off with open surgeries. I went on to tubes and then I have started doing endoscopic. And in fact, uh, I started doing interlaminar before I started doing transforaminal. Uh, and it was the reason, main reason was that I've always been used to the fact that I want to see the whole nerve right from the shoulder, the axilla, which gives me confidence that I have done a thorough discectomy or a decompression. So usually uh, for majority of my paracentral discs, even if it's at L2, 3, L3, 4 levels or L4, 5 levels, I still prefer the interlaminar approach. My 70% of work is still interlaminar. And I usually reserve the transforaminal approach for huge central discs, higher level discs, foraminal or extra foraminal discs. For an example, in this case, where there's a huge L3-4 uh, disc uh, with completely central. Now, in this case, going in transforaminally as flat as possible, uh, I would land completely in front of the disc, and this would be a perfect approach. Otherwise, going into lamina, there would be a lot of bony resection required, a lot of nerve manipulation also required. So this case was operated transforaminally. Similarly, a L5 S1 case with a, a, a foraminal disc like this, and if you see here, that's why x-rays are important, as Arun, Dr. Arun Baron rightly uh, pointed out, there was a low-lying iliac crest, so I was able to get in a trajectory where I could go into the L5-S1 level without doing any trans-iliac uh, decompression, and I could directly dock my tube. So again, this was a case where I prefer to do transforaminal, but otherwise, I definitely prefer interlaminar, and I will tell you the reasons, my reasons as well during the presentation. So obviously... Uh, Knowing so many techniques, various techniques, every technique requires its own set of instruments. And when we're talking about full endoscopic surgery, uh, we require obviously the endoscope and even the instruments. You cannot use your conventional instruments because the lengths are different, the diameter of the instruments are different. So usually for a discectomy, I use a 4.1 mm working channel endoscope. The length is shorter as compared to the transforaminal. And the instruments are anyway ranging from 2.5 to 4 millimeters. Uh, you require different sets of keratin punches, this forceps. You cannot use any open surgery or min other kind of minimally invasive uh, instruments uh, when you're doing a full endoscopic surgery. And we also use a lot of radio frequency cauteries and even specialized bursts. So uh, you do require to invest in specialized instruments, which yes, it is a drawback. One of the drawbacks of a full endoscopic surgery as compared to uh, other surgeries where you can still use your conventional instruments. Um, the usual OT setup, <clears throat> if, if in this case I was standing on the right side, I have my scrub nurse next to me, irrigation towards the top, the monitor, light source, and camera are on the opposite side. The CRM usually comes, so during, during interlaminar, we usually take just one AP X-ray just to take your basic entry point, and then the CRM is put in the lateral position. And also what happens is when you have the CRM in the lateral position, you can actually rest your elbow on the other side of the CRM, so which gives you some comfort and takes away some strain from your trapezius muscle. Uh, so, the, and so once the patient is positioned, you take a straight AP as compared to transforaminal surgeries where we square the vertebra. Uh, for the entry point in interlaminar, we don't need to square the vertebra. We take a straight AP and you see the interlaminar space and we try and go as medial as possible to the center. Uh, and we take a simple stab incision around five, uh, five millimeter incision. And then a dilator is inserted uh, like any of our tube or any other uh, techniques you use that we insert a dilator 
the dilator is basically first we try and insert it towards the medial border of the facet so you get a bony point and then using the dilator try and scoop the muscles off the lamina feel the above lamina the lower lamina feel the interlamina space so it gives you a basic gist of exactly where you are and then <clears throat> once the dilator is docked into position uh, the outer cannula is put in now the cannula we use is a is a beveled cannula uh, there are a lot of advantages of this bevel you also get the restrict cannulas also but this bevel is preferred because for nerve root retraction you can actually change the direction of the cannula which i'll show you in the video uh, you must know which side the bevel is facing this could be for interlaminar or transforaminal so it gives you a basic idea of where you are once you insert your endoscope uh, for full interlaminar endoscopy we have the working channel which is 4.1 mm uh, the camera and that's your irrigation portal for continuous saline uh, irrigation the other thing why I like, I like the interlaminar technique more over the transforaminal technique because it gives you a lot of flexibility. So you can zoom in and you can zoom on, which obviously you can also do this in the interlaminar. However, the flexibility with regards to going inferiorly, superiorly, medially, over the top, laterally, uh, is much more in the interlaminar uh, technique. Transforaminal, once you, the most important is to dock your camera, your needle position, but once your camera is docked, uh, the surgery is uh, straightforward. You don't need to move the position of the endoscope. However, in telaminar, it's the endoscope is very flexible. You can move it in various directions, and which I think is another big advantage of this. So once we insert the uh, camera, the first thing is you, you see some soft tissue, but I have directly docked. This is the flavum, and I have directly docked on the flavum, just removing some soft tissue. The most important thing when you're doing endoscopy is always use your RF cauterize uh, things before you start getting bleeding because it gets difficult to manage if it bleeds profusely. Uh, made a small rent in the flavum and then I'm, I'm moving my cannula to stretch the flavum to use its elasticity. So we don't even need to remove the flavum in, in its entirety. And then using a cutter from medial, I'm moving towards the lateral border and making a small rent. Obviously, this view is completely magnified, but the rent is less than, the, the flavum is split, hardly a one, less than a millimeter cut. We see some epidural fat around here, which we are removing. You, everything is magnified. So even small epidural vessels, you see, so that's why the RF probe is very, very important here because sometimes you need to use it directly over the nerve. Now I am just moving, mobilizing my nerve. I can see the disc below. And once the nerve is mobilized, we rotate our outer cannula. That's why the bevel is important because I've rotated my cannula and I've pushed my nerve completely medially. So <clears throat> as you see here, the, the the bevel is rotated. So now my nerve is pushed medially and it's completely out of my way of work. So the chances of nerve damage are absolutely minimal. Once this is done, the disc is removed. <clears throat> you easily get a giveaway like your open surgeries. And once the piece was removed, I've derotated my cannula. And here I can see completely this is the main dura. And that's my S1 nerve. I can see the whole axilla. I can see the whole shoulder. Uh, and I know that the disc is completely removed in totality. So in these situations, I know when I, I'm used to seeing the nerves like this, even when you need to do MED or any kind of surgery, you want to see this. And whenever you go to a transforaminal approach, you see the border of the nerve, but I, I, I never get to see this completely, like from the shoulder till the axilla. Uh, and again, the reason why I prefer this is that... Uh, you know, it gives me more confidence that I've done a thorough job and I've not left any disc behind. Again, as I said, that the flexibility of the moving the endoscope superiorly, inferiorly, even at the L4-5, L5 level, or even above levels, you can go right from pedicle to pedicle and completely see the, the root and, and the nerve in its totality. So <clears throat> this was the same patient's MRI uh, four days post-surgery, and you can see that the, the, it's very well <clears throat> decompressed. Uh, the best thing you see here is that the lamina is completely intact. I have not done any kind of burring. Uh, sometimes you don't need any kind of burring, even at the L4-5 levels in younger patients. Or if you do, it's just minimal enough just so that your cannula can go into the epidural space. Uh, even if you see on the right, the ligament and flavum is absolutely intact. The small rent you see here is the rent which I had made in the flavum. So you are not touching anything anatomically. Uh, the musculature, if you compare it to the left side, is, is absolutely the same. Uh, and the same patient, for, this is my first one of my first patients six years ago, and we got an MRI done four years later. Uh, usually, 
we see in the MRI post surgery laminar Tommy defects, adhesions, etc. But in an MRI done at a very reputable hospital, there was no mention of any kind of uh, surgery ever done on this patient. And this, I believe, is a truly uh, surgical strike strike on the disc. You know, there is hardly any collateral damage, which I feel is the one of the biggest advantages of full endoscopic surgery, transferaminal or interlaminar. Uh, the another, another reasons why I prefer interlaminar. So. Uh, once I have, now if you see this case, this was an L4-5 case with a huge uh, central disc. Uh, I have already gone down and I can see this big piece of disc lateral to the nerve. And once I remove these pieces, I removed almost four to five huge chunks of <coughs> pieces uh, with this, uh, uh, through this. And the reason why I'm showing this case is that uh, you can see the complete nerve beautifully uh, so I can see a whole nerve. It is quite flexible right now. Uh, I'm still probing the disc. I'm still removing two or three more pieces which are coming out uh, from the disc space. Uh, and based on the MRI, which was more of a big central piece, uh, in fact, I, I generally, even when I was doing MEDs or uh, even with endoscopic, I was quite, I would have been happy that I've achieved a thorough <coughs> decompression. However, having the habit of always checking the nerve right from the shoulder to the axilla actually saved me in this case. So now when I moved, started going down towards the axilla, so you see here, this is the L5 nerve. I realized that I found that the nerve is still pushed a bit laterally. I was not finding it completely free. So instead of having a bit flat in the axilla, I wanted to explore the axilla. And once I started exploring the axilla, I realized that there were still a lot of chunks of disc lying around in the axilla which was still compressing the nerve. So if I would have left the case the way it was, this patient would not have had complete relief. Now on probing further the axilla, I still removed three to four more pieces of uh, loose lying fragments in the axilla. And I think this can only be achieved uh, using an interlaminar approach. Uh, I, in my hands, I'm not confident if I would have been able to achieve this through the transferaminal approach, even that was l fight disc, because visualizing the axilla would per se would be very difficult. And again, further pieces still coming out from the axilla. And once it's free, you can now visualize right from the shoulder till the bottom that now, yes, my nerve is free. And now I'm confident that this patient is going to be pain-free. I probably would have missed this otherwise. So we, I mean, literature does show us that there are various papers on interlaminar approach. Now it has been done since like 2006, which has shown why I mean, interlaminar has proved itself uh, along with other conventional surgeries, right from tubular to distanders to other, and it, and it has shown similar results. However, one thing I would like to show is that the learning curve of the transferaminal approach is steep initially. And that is because we are not very used to the anatomical approach. We are not used to going from the foramen through the uh, regular surgeries. So initially the transferaminal approach, the curve was steep, but it was very easy to learn because you don't need uh, your hands, you don't need much of maneuver, uh, maneuvering the scope. Uh, so it's much more easier to master. However, the learning curve for the interlaminar approach was flat at first because we are very used to the approach, but however, it was much more hard to master. So the technique as such is difficult. Uh, I think still mastering open techniques, tubes is always better to start with. I had that uh, advantage where I knew I was majority of my cases were done through tubes and then I ventured into endoscopic. Your vision from big to is becoming more and more small. So learning the anatomy, knowing exactly where you are is very, very important. So a few tips for people who want to start interlaminar endoscopy or transferaminal. Interlaminar is a familiar approach. Uh, initial cases can be converted to MED or open. Uh, I would advise everyone to observe a lot of cases. Uh, now with technology, we have a lot of YouTube videos available. Keep on watching cases, master the anatomy, where you don't need to ask your, <clears throat> the surgeon what side it is, where what is superior, what is inferior, what is medial. Once you see that image, you should know exactly where you are. Do a lot of cadaveric courses and workshops and then try this on your patients. Uh, again, the reason why I like interlaminar is that I can increase my indications. We can start doing T lifts, stenosis. So overall, all our work more is on stenosis. Our majority of our discs, they get better with conservative management. So we do much more stenosis. So only if you know the interlaminar discectomy technique, that's where you can move on to stenosis. Then you can move on to thoracic. You can move on to cervical 
for example, lateral discs at C5, C6, even they can be easily with a small butthole posteriorly through the interlaminar approach, you can start doing cervical discectomies and cervical foraminotomies. So I think interlaminar approach is important now uh, if you want to be an endoscopic spine uh, surgeon. Thank you. So if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, I think Stambha, uh, Dr. Kaushik yeah. from Chandigarh. Yes. Hi, sir. Stambha, very nice presentation. I mean, I must congratulate you. You have presented a very balanced view of transformanic cases and interlaminar also. Being a transformanic guy and then shifting to interlaminar. A very, I mean, I'm very happy that you have stuck a balance. You have not uh, stuck to a... Most of the transformanic guys say we have a different philosophy. We don't fall into that trap. But now you're accepting that interlaminar do have a role and transformanic technique do have uh, limitations. Definitely. So good. I mean, that's very nice and crisp message to the youngsters because now we have got so many, much of endos endoscopic armor material coming in the market. The yeah, youngster is ever confused. He is buying transformanic set also. He is buying interlaminar also. He is buying UV also. He is a confused guy. He is attending all the workshop and then he is directionless. So very nice and apt presentation. Now, I think the video which you have shown, it's a very good, I mean, we know that L5S1 is an interlaminar wide window and you have shown a very classical, it was a Malai type of a case. Now, uh, a case where there is a tight L5S1 window and there is a bony window also. So how does, uh, how do you go, uh, how do you manage? Yeah, so, so no, I said, that case? initially, I mean, learning the, uh, studying the MRI is absolutely important. Obviously, you need to have your birth system on uh, with you. We cannot start interlaminar endoscopy without having, uh, without the hospital having uh, a birth system. Uh, but obviously, the x-rays and the MRI do give us a guide as to whether the patient would require any kind of burring. So in a case of a tight window, where I know that my... So even when you dock your cannula, you have a rough idea. So a lot of these tight windows, your cannula is slightly half on the medial part of the facet and it is you know half over the interlaminar, uh, uh, the flavum region. In those situations, I'm mentally prepared that this patient is going to require some amount of burring. Mm -hmm. So I start with our usual approach, you know, burring out the so part of, slightly part of the superior lamina, the part of the medial facet, and then doing the same approach down, then start removing the flavor. Uh, sometimes where I'm in doubt whether I may be able to venture in, sometimes I even remove the flavor. I see whether I'm able to go to the lateral aspect of the nerve very clearly. A lot of patients have lateral stenosis. And then also I start boring the medial part of the facet. However, uh, that I would advise anyone to do at a later stage because boring with a completely canal open can get dangerous. However, we have lateral protective uh, hoods, etc. with uh, the which Dr. Pradeep, uh, <coughs> Dr. Lokhande will show us in his uh, technique of stenosis. But definitely, even at NLFIS1, especially in older patients where you have facet joint hy uh, hypertrophies, lateral recess stenosis, a burr is required. I would not advise anyone to start without having burr, uh, the burr system with them. So it's always there, especially higher levels, L4, 5, L3, 4, you do require to burr. But I really truly believe that L5, S1, majority of young patients with big interlaminar windows, you, I rarely burr in those instances. Because we try, I mean, we are doing minimally invasive surgery where we want to, again, save the natural anatomy as much as possible and be as minimalistic as possible. So, uh, but definitely if it's tight canal, burring is required. I would not risk to put in my cannula into a tight canal. I may cause more damage. Thank you, Sambhav. Thank you. One more question. During pure yes. endoscopy, how do you address dural tear if, uh, I mean, dural tears are scared <clears throat> to complete, they're going to happen. Absolutely, sir. How Absolutely. Sir. So, I have had dural tears in a couple of cases, especially for stenosis. Discectomies, very rarely in my starting five cases, I had one dural tear. It was a very small tear. There were no rootlets coming out or nothing. Frankly, even with tubes, we have seen that we put in a glue and we just take, even if you don't stitch uh, the tear, you just close, do a tight closure, it's fine. Similarly, because uh, the area you're opening is so less, so I generally just put in a glue and I just take a deep superficial, uh, deep skin suture and that's about it. I don't address, I don't try to uh, suture the tear. In one of the stenosis cases, I had where the rootlets had popped out. They were completely out like spaghetti. I tried to put them back inside uh, through my, so I had a stenososcope. I had a wider working channel, which was a 5.7 uh, 5 millimeter working channel. But in spite of me trying to put them in, they were coming out. 
And in that situation, I had to convert it. I didn't even put my tubes in. I just opened the patient up. So uh, one more advice to people who want to start endoscopy. Like, frankly, I didn't try to buy, get the patient to me by selling endoscopy or using the word. I just told them I'm doing a discectomy. Like my first case ever, which I tried to do, my radio RF cautery fell down by my sister. And I didn't have one on standby. I had to open the case. Because they, one cautery costs around 20,000 and initial cases, you're not going to have three, four lying on standby. And I had invested everything myself in a private hospital. So initial cases, I have never tried to sell endoscopy. I've just told them discectomy. So even I'm not under the pressure of completing the case just by doing an endoscopy. So that would be my advice for everyone to start. And don't try to sell endoscopy to the patient. Sell your discectomy. Try to do it endoscopically because that stress of trying to do just endoscopically and not doing a good job is, I think, you know, it spoils the name of the surgery as well. So that would be my advice. Uh, Summer, Amit here. Hi, Amit. Uh, so how, how would you deal with calcified discs uh, endoscopy? Yeah. <clears throat> so we've had a couple of instances where we've had calcified discs. So you get, we have osteotomes as well. We have burr as well. So as you saw that, you know, uh, in fact, with endoscopy, it's very easy to uh, deal with this uh, calcified disc also because you can actually, uh, you know, mobilize a nerve medially, completely take it away, move your cannula around. So you are just directly above the calcified portion. And we have these osteotons through which you can break it or you can use your burr, just make a rent and then uh, scoop out the disc. It's, 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 it's quite possible. Hi, Ketan here. Can I make a comment? Sure, please. Yeah, uh, I, uh, excellent presentation. 99% uh, I agree with all the points that you have made, except for one point wherein you had shown a foraminal disc at alpha S1 and you said that a low-lying uh, iliac crest iliac is crest. what prompted yeah. you to go for that. But yeah. I think that uh, iliac crest point is only valid for a paracentral or a central disc herniation. Even for alpha S1, if you have a foraminal disc, doesn't matter. for To reach the foramen, even if you have a higher iliac crest, you can still do it. So that's just one comment. Just excellent Absolutely. presentation. Okay. Thank you. So uh, with this, we now go to uh, the next talk by uh, Dr. Pamod Lokande, who is going to give us uh, technique and case presentations on uh, stenosis uh, using a full endoscopic uh, decompression approach. Dr. Lokande, over to, over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sambo. And thank you, Bisa, for inviting me uh, in this today's talk on endoscopy. So I think it's just an extension of whatever Sambhav has uh, already talked about. And uh, so this is the focus of my talk, uh, lumbar canal stenosis. And uh, as we all know, the, we classify lumbar canal stenosis into central lateral recess and foraminal stenosis. So what I personally feel is central and lateral recess stenosis, they are better dealt with by the interlamina approach. Whereas foraminal stenosis, uh, the only way you can uh, decompress foraminal stenosis is by a transforaminal approach. And uh, I prefer to give a normal neutral or lordotic position uh, uh, while decompressing lumbar canal stenosis patients for the real reason because it uh, mimics the real life position of you know, standing upright while walking. And it's always a problem of walking and standing uh, rather than, you know, sitting. So I think this is the better way of decompressing so that you don't under decompress. In kyphotic spines, there is always a tendency to under decompress the spine. The technique is quite similar. The technique of docking the working channel is very similar to what Dr. Sambhav has already talked about. Uh, but the only difference is I take a slightly lateral entry because uh, it's easier for me to get to the opposite side. It's easier for me to get to the uh, under the spinous forces over the dura and reach the opposite pedicle. So the, these are the few you know slides showing the docking of the working channel. You mark the center of the interlaminous space, take an incision, insert the dilator till it reaches the face at joint level. Uh, newcomers, I always suggest them to advance the dilator in the, in the lateral view of the CM. And once the position is confirmed, you insert the working channel on top of it. And that's the final position of the working channel. This is how you hold the endoscope and this is, this is how you position the video endoscopic trolley. And once the endoscope is inserted, I think the first step is to 
identify the bony landmarks the dissection in cases of lumbar canal stenosis is much more extensive as compared to in uh, to that of a disc here you have to identify the superior inferior lamina the medial margin of the facet then the next more, most important thing is to identify the tip of the descending facet which is the tip of the inferior facet of the superior vertebra so once that is identified the drilling starts at the tip of the descending facet like this i always use a oval burr which is 4 mm in size with a side protection and drilling is always done under very high magnification so that it prevents any inadvertent uh, you know movements or damage to the underlying neural structures the more magnified view you have you have, you have better control of the instruments and the drilling is continued till you reach the tip of the ascending facet that is superior facet of the inferior vertebra and this is the ascending facet then you start drilling the medial margin of the ascending facet like this you see you always drill it uh, do the drilling or the bony work before you have removed the ligamentum flavum i always try to keep the ligamentum flavum till the last till i completely do my finish my bony work it protects the underlying neural structures and once the bony work is completed this is how you you know uh, start drilling you go from the medial margin of the facet go to the su superior lamina and once that is done you come to the inferior lamina to drill the inferior lamina the basic aim is to detach the attachments of the ligamentum flavum so you start with flavec flavectomy you uh, start cutting the flavum piecemeal layer by layer till you open up the epidural space then you start cutting it laterally towards the facet joint this is a wide carison 5 mm carison which i'm using to remove the bone and the ligamentum flavum now depending on the school of thought you follow most of the times i try to do a complete flavectomy most people they don't like to do a complete flavectomy but my personal opinion is i prefer to do a complete flav flavectomy this is the ipsilateral decompression and once the ipsilateral decompression is completed you tilt the endoscope under the spinous process over the dural sac to the opposite side like this and uh, this is the opposite sided facet joint you drill the medial margin of the hypertrophied facet of the opposite side then the remaining thinned out part of the facet is removed with a carison punch that's the lateral border of the opposite nerve root or the contralateral nerve root that is the contralateral axilla and this is the final well decompressed opposite nerve root the dural sac and the ipsilateral nerve root so the extent is always from the tip of the ascending facet superiorly till the middle of the descending facet till the middle of the pedicle inferiorly and uh, this is again another video showing the decompression of the opposite side and this is a very hypertrophied facet joint with hypertrophied ligamentum flavum and there you see i keep on drilling the opposite facet till aim is to uncover the nerve root on the opposite side aim is to try to visualize uh, the lateral border of the nerve root till you reach the lateral border of the nerve root i don't think the decompression is ever complete so this is the removal of the thinned out facet this is the drilling of the inferior lamina now and that's the thin out facet which i am removing to uncover the nerve root even the lateral border and that's the well decompressed contralateral nerve root the axilla the dural sac there you, i'm able to insert my uh, uh, bipolar trigger flex hand uh, tip and mobilize the nerve root this is the dural sac and the well decompressed ipsilateral nerve root so all this has been done through a 10 mm incision and depending on the availability i think sometimes i use a 10 mm uh, uh, stenosis endoscope which is 5.7 mm working channel endoscope but many times i use a regular interlaminar endoscope which is 4.1 mm working channel endoscope it doesn't matter the bigger endoscope is slightly faster you can finish the complete work you can do one level in 40 minutes or 45 minutes but the smaller endoscope may take some more time maybe 10 15 minutes more as compared to the larger endoscope this is again another case right sided approach l45 you can see the 
part of the superior lamina has been drilled and the interlaminar space is very narrow this is the inferior lamina and this is the superior lamina so it doesn't matter how severe severe the canal stenosis it is um, i mean you can do any kind of stenosis with this technique so here i have used a slightly different technique i have detached the superior attachment of the ligament of levum <clears throat> this is the drilling of the inferior lamina now i am detaching the inferior attachment of the ligament of levum here so once that is done i'm uh, you know mobilize and separate the ligament of levum from the underlying dural sac and the nerve root and <clears throat> the entire levum is removed on block as a single piece so this is the big levum which i have removed as a single piece that's the dural sac now i've tilted my endoscope to the opposite side that's the under surface of the opposite levum i have detached the attachment from the underlying lamina you go on on the surface on the top of the levum to reach the opposite facet joint here i am drilling the opposite facet joint keeping the ligamentum levum intact and this is the final detachment of the superior from the superior lamina of the opposite side and this is the detachment of the flevum from the inferior lamina and you can again remove this opposite flevum flevum also as a large chunk this is the drilling of the inferior lamina of the opposite side and here is the thickened flevum which is covering the nerve root the hypertrophied facet is again thinned out with a burr and then gradually removed with a thin kerisen punch this is the lateral border of the nerve root and that's the opposite exiting nerve root so we have decompressed three nerve roots in this case the opposite exiting nerve root opposite traverse, traversing nerve root and the ipsilateral traversing nerve root so this is my management strategy for stenosis usually in lateral recess if there are unilateral symptoms you just do an unilateral decompression with or without discectomy depending on the need if there are bilateral symptoms in lateral recess stenosis or there is a central uh, central stenosis if there is no disc or unilateral disc i prefer to do a unilateral approach for bilateral decompression whereas if there is bilateral radicular pain or if there is a bilateral uh, broad based disc herniation which is compressing the nerve root from the anterior side on both the sides i usually prefer a bilateral approach with a bilateral decompression through a single incision the skin, the skin incision is just the same only the facial incision is different so some old cases which are one of my first cases this was like 7 uh, 8 years back a very severe stenosis uh, right sided approach done and you can see the decompression there another case uh, again over the top decompression complete phlebectomy done with the decompression of the opposite nerve root and here you can see that the how much the phlebum is removed and see how wide uh, you know how the uh, canal diameter is increased post operatively so just to summarize i think uh, although technically demanding it is a very safe and effective procedure clinical outcomes are always you know as good as the open surgery or tube surgery or whatever so don't doubt about the incompleteness of uh, the technique in any ways uh, but it has all the advantages of minimal invasive spine surgery which has less access related injury less hospital stay less post operative pain and early return to work and what i particularly feel is important it's very effective in decompression of the contralateral side with minimal compli uh, complications uh, which is not so well done with the help of a microscope thank you can i ask something dr pramod yeah so so very very well presented as always and so wonderful to see such a beautiful decompression getting done but at the same time i just want to ask you like if you also have a have a disc component not the soft one but a hard one it is also the part of the lump stenosis which we see see sometime and especially in degenerative disc do do you, you go for only the the posterior decompression or do you go and tackle that also uh, so that is one question and because i have seen few people really going in and especially with endoscope and getting rid of that also and how 
technical challenging it could be to do that no i don't think it is much of a technical challenge I, uh, we have a lot of instruments specialized instruments which can deal with the ossified or a calcified disc so depending on the need i think whatever you know principles we follow for op open surgery i think the same principles they remain for endoscopic surgery the principles of surgery they don't change only the technique uh, is changing we are doing everything whatever we are doing in open surgery through an endoscope so we use uh, face mills or we have uh, uh, you know round bar uh, which can uh, which we can use you know to drill the ossified or calcified disc which you said talked about just now lot of times we have those uh, you know uh, vertebral end plates spurs which are protruding and they are kinking the root so it's possible that once we retract the nerve root with the rotation of the working channel the nerve root is protected i generally use a face mill which is just a hand held drill with a sharp uh, you know to a teeth like structure on the on the on the front and you just uh, you know rotate the drill like this and it will just shave off whatever protrusions or uh, you know uh, calcify uh, calcifications are there in and uh, compressing on the nerve root so i don't think that's much of a challenge i think it's very easy you know arun you are you wanted to ask a question here yeah. see uh, actually uh, anyone who is using the interlaminar approach and using the drill etc would wow which that removing a calcified component of a disc is much safer with the endoscopic approach because you do not rely on any assistant who is retracting the nerve root and then you are drilling or using a sharp instrument to cut the calcified part the control of the nerve root is in your hand because you have rotated the bevel and the nerve root is away from your vision and you can safely work on the calcified component very easily and very safely so this myth can be busted that calcified discs are difficult to remove they are actually safer and more effective we tackled with the interlaminar approach dr pradeep hey, also uh, has a question yeah yeah pramod yeah pradeep here uh, if you go over the top how often you do internal laminoplasty which is under cutting of opposite contralateral lamina or you do it in every cases or what is your rationale of doing that it depends on the need sometimes you know it depends on what kind of stenosis you have if you feel that mm -hmm. it's a combination of bony with levum stenosis i think you should do it sometimes mm -hmm. uh, you know, stenosis is not a single entity it's a big spectrum sometimes you just have a medial overhang of the facet where the nerve root is under you know compressed under the medial part of the facet in that case you just remove the medial margin of the facet and you are okay with it sometimes we just have a hypertrophic phlegm sometimes we have uh, the the interlaminar space which is very narrow and you are not able to reach uh, the superior laminar overhang is much more so depending on the need we can do all those things so whatever we you know we can uh, plan pre operatively so i judge okay. it uh, case by say, case it is on never in one plan for all okay dr dr varun you want yeah yeah so i have a question for dr uh, uh, pramod and uh, you also so what kind of anesthesia you are using for these kind of cases frankly to be frank you know uh, personally uh, i don't think anesthesia should be a domain of surgeon you know it's something which is uh, let the anesthetist decide it and uh, it's it's a good thing that some cases you can do it under local anesthesia it's uh, it's but i think it's very important for us to choose the patient wisely uh, we are ultimately all these advanced techniques we are doing it for the benefit of the patient and the comfort of the patient there is no point in thinking just about the post operative comfort comfort when intraoperative the patient is extremely uncomfortable so you know think uh, choose your patient widely there are some cases which we can do under local anesthesia they are mainly transforaminal approaches uh, interlaminar approaches because it is uh, you know uh, uh, it uh, involves retraction of the nerve root and handling of the nerve root i think uh, the patient may not be that comfortable i have done it once uh, i got away with it but personally i don't prefer to do it uh, presently i do you know interlamina approach uh, sometimes under spinal anesthesia just like any other you know uh, if some anesthetist is not comfortable he gives epidural but uh, most of the times i prefer a general anesthesia because many of these patients they are elderly and they have those they are those covert hypertensives lot of times we see that the patient is you know uh, 
put on uh, put prone on the bo- bolsters and suddenly his bp shoots out and the anesthetist is completely who is not uh, intubate the patient if he is not intubated the anesthetist anesthetist is not comfortable in reducing the blood pressure too much so this is my main worry to get a clear field of vision i usually prefer general anesthesia but i think uh, depending on the surgeon's choice or rather uh, i would say anesthetist choice choice uh, let them select the anesthesia let us worry about the surgical technique and the patient also yeah the, so yeah. uh, one question uh, to arun dr pramod also uh, to start with uh, so when I, i started doing stenosis now even now uh, the doctor pramod said it takes around 45 minutes per level uh, dr arun on an average how much time would you be taking for a stenosis it's usually more to than do. an hour more than an hour for me so, it is about uh, one and a half hour yeah so a similar i mean i have also i mean still we are going i'm going through the learning curve uh, every case is making us better but right now um, i do if it's a multi level i sometimes really i feel that i i'm going to get bored doing endoscopy in that patient and frankly been doing tubes initially um, i always generally land up when it's more than a level i land up putting the tubes and i started doing decompressions that's okay that's okay yeah so i mean and i because the bony work is almost the same when it comes to gastric stenosis we are removing the whole flavor mass such um to be very honest i have not seen that great an advantage of an endoscopy over a tube or a distando or a ub for an example because eventually we are doing the same amount of uh, decompression all of us in with different forms although yes magnification has played a role uh, dural tells uh, tears have been much more easy for me to uh, manage through the endoscopy rather than uh, uh, with tubes or with open surgeries uh, so one for uh, multi level stenosis would you still do endoscopy dr pramod dr anur and question for dr ketan uh, dr mohanda kaushal also that do you feel there is an advantage of ub or distando and even amit and varun or med over a endoscope when it comes to uh, stenosis and multi level stenosis so dr arun if you can start if you feel there is a I, clear I advantage you don't go beyond two level mostly uh, whenever there is a single level stenosis i will prefer doing endoscopy sometimes in two levels but uh, not more than that because it's the time taken to do it and uh, my own uh, shoulder my comfort to do it beyond a certain time is also that matters to me so yes if i can do it in a very quick time probably yes but then uh, it's it, uh, time is usually of less concern except for your own comfort uh, i do not totally agree with this thought that you can you are doing the same work in med or microscopic because in the endoscopic full endoscopic you are using a fluid as an irrigation which is in tight stenotic canals many a times it is additional dissecting tool and you also agree that your incidences of dural injuries is much less for similar cases the reason is that you get a very clear field of vision and you are so close to the neurological structures that you are able to uh, preempt a tear before it actually happens which may not be possible in microscopic techniques because you are looking so far from here you are looking just under the structure which you want to cut so that ensures higher safety for your procedures and lesser complication so i would agree that yes you would choose multi level you can choose whatever you are comfortable with but the technical advantage of the full endoscopic technique still stays there yeah personally i feel that most of my cases are uh, two level stenosis uh, but i have done quite a few three levels also three levels are cumbersome but uh, i feel that uh, as you get more and more used to it's uh, just a matter of practice you know keep on doing the things again and again and after a certain time you just you know get adapted to it but if you compare single level to three level of course uh, single level is much more comfortable for the surgeon and easy for the surgeon as compared to three level uh, dr ketan what about uh... you be technique i mean do you think it it would make any difference as compared to a full endoscopic interlamina with regards to stenosis i mean i know that the instruments you use you don't have to invest in uh, a lot of these instruments but yeah definitely most of your open spine instruments can be used and you can use an arthroscope you don't need a working channel endoscope but then uh, we all have to agree on one point that uh, interlaminar or transforaminal would be the least invasive form of surgery there is no doubt about that 
the amount of soft tissue cutting as you rightly said in a ub would be comparable to that of med except for the medium of surgery and the vision that you are getting and uh, as far as the number of levels and timing is concerned i think uh, the timing should be as much as you require to get a good decompression and not measured in minutes and hours uh, in my personal experience i've done lot of three level decompressions and uh, the time is not x into 3 where x being the time taken for a single level usually one of the levels is extremely stenotic and the other two are okay stenotic we don't want to just leave it in particularly in our indian scenarios where the patient is half happy and half complaining about the persistent symptoms so we want to do all the, whatever is seen on the mri so if i take around 45 50 minutes for a single level decompression i usually finish three level in two hours so that is uh, uh, i mean that's okay when if you take some extra amount of time but three level surgery is definitely doable with ub and as far as the pain part is concerned as you rightly said you also started with open then tubular and then moved on to endoscopy similarly i also done the same thing uh, i am seeing a quite a hell of a difference between the amount of post operative back pain that the patient complains on the same day or the next post operative day. yes if you compare them 3 weeks down the line 3 months down the line i don't think there it matters but yes immediately post op i'm definitely seeing i'm my patients are much more happy with ub technique Uh, one more question, Doctor Kumar. Uh, sometimes when you do a lot of this burning for stenosis, you do get a lot of bleeding from uh, the bone after burning it. And the the cautery with the RF cautery which we use is a flexible tip, slightly soft. It's not very hard, and it gets very difficult sometimes for you know the slope of the lamina which is going down. There is some bleeding coming in from there. To try and angle the cautery inside and to try and get that bleeder into uh, into control. So, do you yeah. have any uh, any tips as to with regards to how do you control uh, that bleeding? I think there are multiple ways of doing it. First of all, I think it's not just the tip of the cautery which needs to be you know angled that way. I think it's the rotation of the endoscope, the rotation of the working channel. All these three together they help you to visualize or access that particular bleeding point properly. secondly i think uh, if you think that uh, the the just uh, coagulation doesn't help or stop the bleeding uh, in certain cases then i would just you know uh, put on a diamond burr on uh, you know and just try to drill uh, that particular area extra with the help of a diamond burr the bi- diamond burr creates a very small very fine bony powder which ultimately blocks these bleeding points so that again helps us a lot it uh, depends uh, sometimes if the bleeding is just a small bleeding you can just hide it behind the working channel and continue doing your work or if it is uh, massive if the entire skin and uh, entire screen is you know obstructed you just remove the endoscope put in the dilator just wait it it's like uh, you know you party at home for you know uh, uh, you know waiting for the bleeding to be stopped so similarly i use the dilator wait for 5 or 6 minutes and then remove the dilator and you can start the surgery again so i think about spinal stenosis i i have done four levels also number is very less but my uh, i do routinely two level uh, canal decompressions in about 1 hour 1 uh, hour 30 minutes and i do it under spinal anesthesia but when i am planning three or four levels then i tell anesthetist i have to do it under g because then it take about 2 hours and for four levels i make two different ports because uh, from best end you now i have graduated to a miniature dest end you can see which is a combined psld and a dry system so i switch over to fluid as arun was telling ki when you are near to the surgical target the fluid is becomes a better medium your uh, identification of the structures becomes better and chances of neural injury or neural injury are minimized so moment i have done my flavor work then i Uh, the I advance the scope closer to the surgical target and switch over to a fluid medium that makes the gives the advantage of a PSLD also to me in the same I mean scenario same system and uh, we do use UB also because of my arthroscopic background I am uh, become comfortable now with the UB also and uh, these the uh, two techniques which I am using in my clinical practice. But four levels that take about two hours, and I switch over to G. Otherwise, my ninety percent of spine endoscopy is whether it is a disc or it is a canal decompression or uh, uh, under spinal anesthesia. And two levels I usually finish off in about one hour, and patients are pretty comfortable under spinal. 
I mean, we are interacting with the patient, we are talking to the patient. Even during risk, I tell them to cuff forcibly to see whether if any hidden fragment is there. In once or twice cases, I have seen when I am doing a disc surgery, some hidden fragment has come out when patient does a cuffing. So uh, this is how, but I mean, this is uh, over 18 to 20 years of endoscopy practice. I mean, in the beginning and the first five to six years, it really is a time consuming process. And as per Mohd or Arun will agree with me, your technique to endoscopy maybe have more learning curve as compared to dry endoscopy. So I think for beginners, surely I always recommend you start with GA. I mean, no, no need of using local or a spinal for that matter. And otherwise, it is a choice of a patient and a surgeon. I always tell my patient which anesthesia you want to choose. And I tell anesthetist, see your comfort and patient safety. So, somehow, I, I suppose it is uh, just, uh, you know, several ways to skin the cat. At the end of the day, these are all interlaminar surgeries. And, and for youngsters, uh, they should, uh, the main, you know, gist of it is that one should, first of all, decide what needs to be done inside the patient and the which technique I can use to give that relief. And that is how one should proceed rather than, you know, just like you rightly said, jumping on and selling endoscopy or MED or Destenda or anything for that matter. And even till this day, all my patients have been counseled that they may require an open surgery. And if there is some, uh, you know, uh, complication inside, I never shy to open them up. So that the patient should be counseled and in writing consent, it is still there even after so much of experience. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. And uh, there was a fantastic uh, presentation, Dr. Lokande, and good discussion. Uh, with that, we move on to Dr. Ayush Sharma, uh, who's going to, uh, we'll have a case discussion. Uh, Dr. Ayush, can you uh, yeah. share your screen and show us the case, please? Yes, yeah. yeah, sure. Sorry. <clears throat> so, can you see the screen, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's uh, straight away go to this case. And uh, this was a 45 year female. She presented with left sided radiculopathy and left sided foot drop since two weeks. So if you see uh, uh, like uh, the x ray, there's nothing significant as such. And the iliac crest is quite okay. And if you are considering interlaminar versus transfer, just to highlight that point. And if you see, this is the disc. So so if you see the like there's L4 5 disc and it is almost going up to the uh, uppermost uh, like end plate of the L4 and I have also given the rest of the cuts and and the, e, e, these are the axials and you can if you see the sections you can see the disc going up to the L4 so uh, the the point being how many of us will be comfortable doing it transferminal or how much of, of us will still choose a interlaminar for all the advantage we just spoke about. Uh, Dr. Amit Sharma, are you here? And I, I just one more Hi, thing. Yes, just, I'm here. Just the, I'll show you that uh, patient's uh, video also. So you can see this is the complete uh, foot drop. You can see on the left side, uh, like uh, sort of uh, she's not at all moving her feet. It's just something. So let's so, go to the. Uh, so Amit, you basically also have, uh, do transforaminal as well, endoscopy. So would this case be something which you would consider? It's a young patient, uh, huge disc, obviously. So would you consider this going transforaminally, or would you still prefer uh, interlaminar approach or MED or what or or a fusion or what would you do? So I have no experience with the uh, interlaminar endoscopy yet, um, and you know that I have only transforaminal scope. So, but this case, I think, will fall. I mean, this is in the gray zone. You can deal it with both the ways. You can go interlaminar or you can go, I think, transforaminal as well. The only worry is this upward migratory fragment, but I think that also can be uh, very well taken care of by just tilting your, even if even if you are going transforaminally, you can just tilt your scope a little bit up and uh, I think that fragment also will come out if you go in a transforaminal method. Yeah, so, yes, I... Yeah. Hello? Yeah, can I... Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. My personal opinion is, uh, you know, we can do this case both uh, transforaminally as well as interlaminar technique. But uh, looking at the patient's symptoms, the patient has got a severe neurological deficit with a foot drop. 
and uh, in such cases uh, given a choice i would prefer to go for a transformal approach for one particular reason because here we are not involved in any retraction of the nerve root or the dural sac already the already the patient is having severe neurological deficit so you just go very take a very lateral approach and you just go under the dural sac and the nerve root and just remove whatever fragments we have like this just two days back i have removed a similar uh, you know patient uh, patient having complete foot drop on one side and around grade 2 power in the uh, on the on the opposite side in the ankle and the feet so a similar <clears throat> technique and uh, i think in this case especially with the broad pedicle which the disc has uh, probably you just catch the base of the uh, base of the disc and the entire disc would come out as a single fragment so i think a transformal approach in such cases would be a better approach considering the neurology and considering the more minimally invasiveness of transformal approach as compared to interlaminar approach dr pramod would this change your uh, your decision if this was a inferiorly migrated disc because superiorly you are still in the shoulder of the nerve but inferiorly migrated generally are in the yeah, axilla inferiorly migrated disc is slightly difficult because that involves a lot of you know drilling and uh, then in such cases you know bilateral foot drops usually i don't put my i remain on the surface uh, i don't put my uh, cannula inside to retract the nerve root just stay on the surface you just go into laminar and try to you know debulk the disc as much as possible once there is a little bit space available when uh, more than half of the disc is removed then you so, go inside and then you retract the nerve root but then in this situation if there is a loose piece which is say medial to the pedicle the superior l4 pedicle uh, yeah. i mean would you be sure that you have removed the whole yeah, piece yeah, because yes sir today i have done uh, three cases of endoscopy and one of them was a you know a, a up migrated um, extra foramenal disc and i had a way i have a very nice video that i'm you know uh, putting my trigger flex bipolar probe around the upper pedicle and coming down and uh, putting the uh, you know trigger flex probe around uh, along the medial margin of the lower pedicle so i am able to see both the pedicles in one you know just by tilting the endoscope in uh, one surgery so i think it's quite possible uh, you know you just uh, get a basic experience and you start playing with your endoscope and anything is possible most of the things uh, just uh, i would suggest that people uh, not to do two level corpectomies with endoscopy because that is still not presently possible you can do small surgeries but not big uh, you know resections or something like that pramod sir ketan here yeah. uh, if you if you observe the axial cut i think there is some amount of lateral recess stenosis also because of the ligamentum flavum so yes, will you not be fact, will you not be worried that when you remove that soft disc and the okay. annular bulging as you we or most commonly see yeah. on the post operative yeah. mri will still yeah. be compressing the traversing nerve root with the ligamentum flavum compare, intact now if you compare the uh, flavum of the opposite side where the disc is yeah. not the yeah. disc is a left paramedian it's not right paramedian and if you look at the thickness of the left paramedian uh, right sided Uh, you know uh, 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 ligament of flavum it's quite thin it's not that bad and pro- probably i think and secondly what i look for is i always discuss with the patient you ask for the history if the patient has recent onset radicular pain then you ask about his previous history maybe 6 months 1 year or 2 years uh, did he ever have any claudication pain or similar kind of radicular pain so if it is just a recent onset and it is correlating with your disc i think you just remove the disc don't worry about the stenosis if the patient has got pre existing claudication pain which has been significant and which the patient has been uh, you know ne- uh, necessarily delaying it for a long time if such is the situation in that case i would uh, try to decompress both the stenosis part and remove the disc also so pradeep uh, saying dr arun uh, any or what would you prefer interlaminar or a transforaminal approach so uh... for myself i have treated similar cases of such severe up migrated disc with foot drop with the transforaminal approach uh, with excellent outcomes but uh, nowadays i would prefer to choose the interlaminar approach in such cases for the sake of ease and uh, i am not worried about retracting the nerve root because pramod has already mentioned that if you come across such large herniation you can keep your cannula dog down to the lamina 
do the drilling and expose the epidural space and first remove the fragment lateral to the nerve root and once you have done a reasonable debulking then only you advance your cannula down onto the surface of the body or the disc to retract and rotate the cannula so um, because i find it is slightly easier and uh, less cumbersome but it is technically very much possible to do such up migrated herniations with the transforaminal approach except that you have to keep the cannula floating so you do not dock it into the disc space you keep it right on the surface of the disc and then you tilt the cannula rotate the bevel cranially and many a times you will grab the tail of the fragment and it will come out as a full fragment and even if it is multi fragmented as you said earlier uh, when you keep the cannula flat you can remove multiple fragments of the disc step by step and then you can see the full length of the traversing nerve root even up to a 2 to 3 cm length of the nerve root can be seen which is fully decompressed uh, dr pradeep what would your uh if you do the for this case would it be a transforaminal approach uh yeah some of can i add something yeah yeah i think uh, the reason why i chose a transforaminal approach in this case if you look at the you know the anatomy of the disc herniation you see it's a very broad based disc and it's exactly in the center you know it's lying under the dural sac Uh, if it was a paramedian disc, I would definitely go inside. But for central disc nowadays, with you know significant neuro neurological deficits, I am a little wary about you know uh, retracting the neural structures when we have such an excellent approach like a transformal approach to go underneath and you just you know remove the disc. Of course, uh, if there was a fragmented disc or a sequestrated fragment or multiple fragments in such cases. and in that case definitely transformal approach may have some certain limitations but uh, large central disc bad neurology i think uh, why to retract neural structures more hey, dr pradeep you were saying uh... yeah 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 so i i would have done the same thing you know transforaminal approach where you know is easy to take out the fragment first and then do central decompression Okay. So uh, I think uh, Kitan, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohanda Kaushal, with regards to your uh, the UB or Destandu or even Varun with regards to MED, uh, you think in such situations you would consider any kind of transforaminal because probably with uh, the techniques we would have to remove a lot of the lamina on one side to go superiorly to access to see uh, the whole shoulder uh, of the nerve and to get the fragment. so would you do this uh, differently or would you stick to your uh, techniques i would so stick to the same technique because uh, as uh, dr arun banuj said when you do some amount of laminotomy and you remove the uh, the disc before you start retracting the nerve root uh, uh, it becomes very simple except for the fact that i would slightly uh, change the uh, the the access points for the scopic and the working portal where in otherwise they would be at the upper and the lower pedicle i would slightly shift them more towards the caudal side so as to get access below the lamina and undercut the lamina and not remove the complete lamina so as to take out the up migrated disc fragment so uh, ayush you can show us what did you do for uh, so, so this case we had all all those things in the mind and finally we i went for interlaminar okay so this is a what we went through so, so uh, this is the classical interlaminar approach and i'll just skip this part this whatever you guys we i'll straight away go to where we have exposed that uh, uh, so so this is where i am so i what i did i approached first to the axilla because the shoulder is it is going up migrated and that area was very very acting anything i straight away went to the axilla and sort of debulked the axilla so the part of the fragment i could really remove so whatever came out easily i removed it once i could debulk the disc from going to the through the axilla that is the time then uh, this is the to the axilla that so still the debulking once i have done the debulking then i went to the shoulder and try to sort of move, mobilize the disc fragment and uh, go to the 
to the edge to grab it so this is so even now i have so you can see how my viewer is looking up and now it was very easy to do that because you know already the there is enough space for the root to move and then i started picking up the disk fragments so these are the disk fragments you can see and uh, they are not one you can you can see as we remove one the next came out and uh, i'm just going in and trying to get a better angle and so so one after another we could remove the fragments so this is one fragment coming out so actually they are not, not one but they were actually uh, will adjust go so now i'm going to the shoulder and this is one fragment which comes out and so big huge fragments and uh, and this is one and then we go in and we get another one and this is so just to show you the size of of the fragment we are removing i'll just show you the external image also that we 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 could capture the exact size of the fragment so we ended up removing actually four big nice juicy fragments from it so this is just this the, the, this is the second fragment which is coming out so each fragment we literally have to remove the whole scope just to take them out because they were literally literally quite big so you can see this is the size of an average fragment so finally we could take a, and this is the end of it from both we can we, we went in the we showed so the uh, we can see the shoulder it was free the dura was free and even uh, we had approached to the axilla before so this these are the four fragments which which finally came out and see this is the patient so see really did well uh, and uh, and uh, this this is the post op mri if you see this is the immediate post op mri so uh, even with the interlaminar and i think going through the axilla literally helped me that i i could make some room before i started uh, uh, mobilizing the nerve root so i didn't have to struggle much because initially when i tried it was as the discussion was going on the root was pretty pretty tight and to mobilize it might would have uh, led to some amount of a retraction injury or something but once i could debulk the thing the disc with the uh, axilla it the everything was very very easy later on so then there was uh, the, the move that you wanted to approach the axilla first and then go up uh, did work for you uh, but how much amount of, uh, did you have to remove uh, quite a lot of lamina on that side no, no, no. because hard, you went from down and you went up you were able to yeah, save the yeah, yeah. So hard, some, some amount of initial work but nothing significant and you can see we could really take out almost everything but i think uh, just debulking it initially before act, uh, actually retracting the root and approaching that fragment did help it to do it in a much safer way considering i was in interlaminar approach because there is some amount of myolateral resistenosis or ligamentum phlegm thickening mildly on that side i mean if uh, yeah, but, yeah. i was to approach this i would probably do some lateral uh, debulking as well but probably because you went in from down and then up was probably it, it's what uh, saved a lot probably what up uh, pramod are you here Prasambha. yeah would you uh, do a similar uh, technique or would if you are going into lamina would there be any difference with regards to uh, decompressing this disc yeah i think um, in such cases um, it's safer to drill the medial part of the facet mm -hmm. more and you know, create more space on the lateral side rather than you know retracting uh, retracting initially then as we discussed earlier just stay on top of the flavum and try to remove as many fragments just by putting a small four steps and try to debulk try to reduce the pressure on the nerve roots and once you know they get a little mobile then you can start you know retracting them and you know searching for the remnant fragments so with with i mean uh, and full endoscopic we generally our docking is on in the interlaminar space that's how we start that's how we go but would anyone do this differently there is but our secretary dr arvind kulkarni there's a paper where such superiorly migrated discs he using the med he makes a burr hole into the lamina and goes through that so would that, anyone that approach is, it that is for a sequestrated disc that is not yes a yes small yes fragments yes. he yes. done it with exactly. so if that would be a, a a loose piece above then probably you would go that route yes 
that is quite possible with the full understanding. Ayush, uh, one question. Uh, uh, Pradeep here. How much bony yeah, work you did for this case? Hardly any. If you see almost the like just the minimum initial part, just to get uh, to the axilla of the disc, uh, whatever the lamina I need to remove, that's it. And if you see almost everything is almost intact. If you see there's hardly much uh, laminar work in the post op MRI is just right in front of you. Okay. So somehow I have a question. Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, like um, how we do for an open case, we put our disc forceps inside the disc material and try to remove the loose fragment from inside, you know, like from the intervertebral area. Yeah. And similarly, yeah. we do the thing for uh, like uh, for an inside out technique in transforaminal approach. We are actually inside the disc, we are removing the pieces from, from intervertebral area first, and then we are trying to kind of target the real pathology. Yeah. So when you guys go yeah. for interlaminar approach, do you tend to go inside that intervertebral area of the disc and uh, tend to remove the uh, loose pieces from there or you just uh, stick to the, the pathology and then just come out? Any, uh, Dr. Arun, anyone wants to take that question? Pardon? So I would like to answer that question. What Amit has asked, would it, do you go into the disc space also to remove all the loose fragments? So for it's such difficult. a large... Epidural fragment, the primary importance is the epidural fragment removal first, especially in a uh, neurological deficit. Now, after having done that, you can, because your cannula is floating, you can come back to the disc level and turn it ventrally. And if you wish, you can remove some in loose fragments from the disc in from the posterior annulus. That is, that is possible. And one should always aim so that you do not have a early recurrence. Uh, definitely. So I mean, uh, probably even I will. Like, I would probably first try and debulk that nerve by removing the the loose pieces outside. But definitely would go into the disc slightly and even check if there are any more loose fragments uh, left over there. Uh, you want to go into the disc once you're able to retract the nerve root medially. So definitely would debulk the nerve first, get those fragments out uh, which are lying in the epidural space. And then definitely would go into the intervertebral space and uh, look for the other fragments. Only if it so, is a, just a simple sequestered fragment, then I yeah, may not yeah. uh, wish to get inside the disc. But if this is something like this connected to the parent disc as well, maybe, yes, you should explore the disc space. Samba, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Arun Banat, sir. Uh, would, sure, you like sure. to, uh, would you like to use gun choice technique here of directly entering the needle into the disc and then sequentially dilating it? Since if it was L5S1, if it was L5S1, I have done quite a few of them in my earlier life uh, the span with the endoscopy, with yeah. the interlaminar approach under local anesthesia without cutting the ligamentum flavum, landing directly onto the herniation. But that requires a very precise planning on the yeah. MRI that where the root is, whether the disc is within the axilla or in the shoulder, and you aim your initial needle on that region, and then. Once you do that, then you can dilate with serial dilators and the root tends to get pushed to the other side. And you can definitely do it. I've done quite a few, uh, but that is long time back, seven, eight years ago. Then I moved on to the current interlaminar technique. In the prone position or lateral position? Yes. Uh, I, I was prefer, um, uh, usually preferring the prone position. Great. Uh, that was a good discussion. Thank you, everyone, so much. Uh, now, for the final part of our MESA tutorial, uh, which, uh, which is Journal Club, where Dr. Atif Naseem will be presenting two papers on uh, today's topic. So, uh, can, uh, can you have Dr. Atif Naseem uh, kindly please share your screen and, uh, screen and your presentation, please? Yes, yes. Uh, so, your screen is visible, sir. Hello. Yeah. Atif, go ahead. We can see your screen, Atif. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, to start with the general cup presentation, today's uh, first topic uh, is a learning curve for interlaminar endoscopic lumbar disectomy, which is a systemic systematic review. It was published under uh, Elsevier Journal uh, World Neurosurgery in June 2021. 
the aim the purpose of this study was to systematically uh, review the published cannot get to this published literature regarding the learning curve of interlaminar endoscopic uh, lumbar discectomy including the cut off points required to achieve the technical proficiency and to discuss how to improve the evaluation of the learning curve and finally to discuss the appropriate training methods uh the inclusion criteria for the various uh, studies and articles that, that th those articles published uh, in any language th those articles research uh, studies on human subjects all types of uh, observational studies and randomized uh, uh, randomized or non randomized control trials studies uh, reporting learning curves and uh, quantitative data on the clinical results of interlaminar endoscopic disc lumbar discectomy so they have included almost 7133 articles through the various electronic database searching uh, and the, the, those data are screened and uh, excluded and finally they have included only three six articles for meta analysis the results are shown the six studies reporting 302 cases of interlaminar endoscopic uh, lumbar discectomy was selected from 7133 screened articles the cut off point was made ran, was randomly set in three studies and determined as the curve asymptote in three studies the mean value for the cutoff point was 22.17 plus minus 12.40 cases that ranges from 10 to 43 cases and they are mainly determined based on the operative time which was shorter in the later group than uh, that in that in early groups the cutoff point were not significant for the patient outcome parameter such as pain scores functional results surgical failure or complication coming to the discussion uh, in general a learning curve has three components the starting point the learning rate and the asymptote at which the curves has plateaued when the expert level has been reached the essential objective of the learning curve studies is to set the cut off point or plateau that discriminates the trained stage from the training stage in a surgeon's learning career so first point for this as the outcome measures and the cut off point in the learning curve this study suggests operative time as a task for efficiency measure and it is a useful parameter to assess the learning status however the learning or mastering of a surgical technique cannot be evaluated only uh, only operative time only by only operative time instead the learning progress should also be assessed using using patient outcomes such as clinical success pain scores functional status complication recurrence or surgical failures the second point is interlaminar versus transforaminal which approach is harder to learn the disc level and the anatomical characteristic indicate that interlaminar and transforaminal is different although interlaminar uh, endoscopic lumbar discectomy can be more easily performed at the l5 s1 level in the patient with high iliac iliac crest and the large interlaminar space transforaminal is a better approach to treat lumbar disc herniation at the level of l4 l5 and superior so finally this study suggests interlaminar endoscopic lumbar discectomy is difficult to learn than the transforaminal but transforaminal approach is more challenging to learn coming to the third point endoscopic versus microscopic is endoscopic discectomy is more difficult to learn the learning curve of inter interlaminar endoscopic uh, discectomy is longer and more complicated than that of microscopic uh, micro discectomy Uh, however once the interlaminar techniques is mastered the operative time is significantly shorter than that of micro discectomy and the fourth and final point on this discussion is how to improve the learning curve the endoscopic we all know endoscopic in spine surgery is a, a single person procedure therefore a well a well organized training course is essential before the surgeon perform their first endoscopic procedure a systematic training course comprises a typical element such as conceptual lectures with operative videos hands on practice with dummy models cadaver workshops and bedside observation of real cases um coming to the limitations uh, this is these studies uh, having uh, constraint of considerable considerable heterogeneity uh, they have, they have included two retrospective and then four prospective studies the three studies were dicomatous comparative study whereas the remaining two, uh, three studies are cumulative sum analysis studies again the pre training level of the surgeons before they started to learn the scopic procedures were not known finally the conclusion uh, the clinical parameters improved in the late stage of learning process of interlaminar endoscopic uh, lumbar discectomy in all studies included in this review most of the determined the cut off point based on the operative time which represent the simple task efficiency and does not account for the patient outcome 
देन फ्यूचर लर्निंग का स्टडीज शुड फोकस ऑन द प्ले टू पॉइंट बेस्ड ऑन द पेशेंट आउटकम्स नॉट ओनली दू टाइम थैंक यू Thank you. Uh, I, do you want to present the next paper also? Okay. Should we discuss this one before we go, or do you want to finish both? I just finish off the presentation, so we can then discuss okay. both of okay. them together. Okay. 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 Atif, uh, go ahead with that. Atif. Uh, am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, go ahead with the next presentation. You yes, finish the the second one also. Coming to the next uh, presentation, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> full endoscopic versus micro endoscopic and endoscopic, a systematic uh, review and meta analysis of outcomes and complications, which is uh, again uh, published in um, 2017 under Elsevier uh, Clinical Neurology and Neurosurgery Journal. coming to the objective the purpose of this study was to systematically compare the effectiveness and the safety of full endoscopic discectomy and the micro endoscopic discectomy with open discectomy uh, for the treatment of symptomatic lumbar disc herniation the methods uh, again the electronic searches were performed using six databases from their inception to february 2016 identifying all the relevant randomized controlled trials and the comparatively observation studies Uh, comparing either full endoscopic or micro endoscopic with open discectomy that those data were then extracted and analyzed according to the predefined clinical endpoints so they have categorized into three uh, three op uh, three parameters that are variables that are operative parameters included uh, operative time estimated blood loss and hospital stay then surgical outcomes which includes uh, total complication recurrence rate reoperation dural tears root injury wound infection spondylodiscitis again uh, the last one is functional outcome um the included uh, that includes post operative was scores or odi scores and patient satisfaction rate then they grouped uh, then they compared them with uh, full endoscopic versus open endoscopic micro endoscopic versus open endoscopic and overall endoscopic versus open discectomy the results are as uh, the 23 studies were selected for analysis uh, that includes uh, 421 full endoscopic cases 6914 micro endoscopic cases and 21152 open discectomy cases C coming to the assessment and results uh, assessment of operative, operative parameters for operative duration uh, the study suggests that full endoscopic discectomy had a significant shorter operative duration compared to open discectomy when micro endoscopic uh, discectomy had a similar operative duration to open discectomy but overall endoscopic approach had a shorter procedural time as compared to the open discectomy coming to the blood loss both full endoscopic as well as the all endoscopic procedures demonstrated a lower estimated blood loss in comparison to the open open approaches though only micro endoscopic and overall endoscopic approaches showed a significant difference in the estimated blood loss as compared to open discectomy then coming to the hosp hospital stay compared to the open discectomy length of hospital stay for full endoscopic micro endoscopic and overall endoscopic approaches was significantly shorter then um, assessment of the surgical outcomes in terms of total uh, complication there was no difference found between the full endoscopic versus open discectomy micro endoscopic versus open or overall endoscopic versus open discectomy how rates of uh, recurrence reoperation dural tears A root injury, wound infection, and spondylodiscitis were similar between full endoscopic uh, versus open, micro endoscopic versus open, and combined endoscopic versus open discectomy. Coming to the assessment of clinical outcomes, uh, five studies reported post-operative uh, VAS scores. Post-operative VAS scores for uh, full endoscopic discectomy is compared compared with open discectomy with no significant difference found. Similar results were obtained by pooling two studies compared with uh, comparing with the micro endoscopic versus open discectomy. Overall, an endoscopic approach yielded similar post-operative VAS scores to an open open approach. Then, in terms of uh, ODI, three studies uh, which compared the uh, full endoscopic versus open had a similar pool score. Similarly, micro endoscopic versus <laughs> open discectomy had a similar post-operative ODI score. So, no significant uh, difference was found between the endoscopic versus open discectomy. 
coming to the uh, patient satisfaction rate, full endoscopic was uh, associated with significant higher pooled patient satisfaction rate compared to open discectomy. There was no, no difference between the microscopic and uh, open discectomy. Overall endoscopic approaches in general including both MED, microscopic and uh, full endoscopic had a higher rate of patient satisfaction compared to the open approaches. So uh, into the discussion, the present systematic review and meta-analysis that pool, uh, pool available evidence uh, comparing either full endoscopic or microendoscopic outcomes to those of open uh, discectomy and demonstrated that no significant difference between any of the discectomy procedure with regards to post-operative VAS and ODI scores but definitely better patient satisfaction than open discectomy. Uh, then again, a shorter hospital stay again in full endoscopic and uh, microendoscopic and endoscopic surgery overall in comparison to open discectomy. Reduced blood loss, blood loss with the endoscopic approaches as compared to the open surgery and similar rate of complication and the operation between all the three groups. Coming to the limitations of the studies, uh, uh, many of these studies included are not a large scale studies. They could have investigated uh, investigated cost effectiveness of different endoscopic techniques uh, against uh, the open discectomy. Again, the patient expectation to the self-reported outcomes uh, is not, uh, are not included at, since the studies were not blinded. Again, non-surgical factors such as rehabilitation and pain management are not taken into consideration. Then substantial heterogeneity between the studies in all the statistically significant comparison of the post-operative was and ODI scores, and they have, not, they have they might have they should have included the impact of learning curve. Therefore, future research should, should focus on the providing high quality, large scale uh, primary evidence directly comparing discectomy techniques with a focus on cost efficacy, complication, and patient outcome. To conclude with the article, based on the current analysis, endoscopic approach was associated with similar post-operative VAS and ODI scores, but improved patient satisfaction and lower operating time, blood loss, hospital stay in comparison to open approaches. Full endoscopic and microendoscopic appear to be the safe and efficacious alternative to traditional approaches, but these results require further investigation and validation by adequately powered randomized and prospective studies. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, these papers are open to discussion. Just two things. So we had two papers. One was learning curve and one was comparative an, uh, analysis of three different techniques. And learning curve, obviously endoscopic has a full endoscopic has a higher learning curve. Uh, interlaminar has a higher learning curve as compared to transforaminal. And now results wise, we don't see much difference between uh, full endoscopic as compared to any micro endoscopics or uh, distandus or UV. So uh, are we doing something wrong or are we doing the wrong technique? Yeah. Obviously, uh, uh, the conclusion uh, is I mean, we still don't know. A lot of studies are left. Uh, I just think one thing is that having done uh, all kind of techniques, I personally feel that the amount of uh, uh, bony uh, removal or phlegm removal with regards to full endoscopic as compared to MED or any other technique in full endoscopic is much less. So I think with time, with having follow-ups of MRIs after four or five years, the amount of increased degeneration secondary to a discectomy, uh, probably interlaminar endoscopy, hopefully will turn out to be superior. But uh, looking at these studies, uh, Dr. Arun, Dr. Mohandar Kaushal, Dr. Pramod Lokan, any, any, any comments? Uh, are, we, are we giving the newer generation the right... Uh, uh, advice by getting into these techniques or should we stick to the old guns? So, uh, Sambhav, if you read the outcome of the conclusion in this last presentation, last slide, it says that it is, the results are similar on VAS and ODI, but much better on operative time, patient satisfaction, and so many other para parameters. And why does the patient come to you to get a satisfactory outcome? In if you you can tell the patient that your ODI is good, your VAS is good, but you patient says I am not happy with the surgery. Would you accept? But your patient satisfaction is given less importance, whereas that is the most important point that a patient has to be satisfied when he or she comes to you for a treatment. Anyway, intuitively, we know that we talk about minimally invasive and this happens to be the most minimally invasive technique anywhere possible as of now. 
that you, your full endoscopic techniques are the least invasive out of all because you do not violate hardly any structures. So ultimately, it's a matter of time when they will be proven to be beyond doubt, proven to be superior. Right now, we have to pass through this phase where they are uh, brought down to the level of all open surgeries and micro surgeries that to make everybody who's uh, doing all this happy and satisfied that uh, I'm doing this good. So that let it be till that time because as time is passing, everyone is witnessing that more and more people are wanting to have this done. Similarly, more and more surgeons are keen to learn and adapt them in their armamentarium. That reflects where the winds are blowing. Uh, I'd be sad, but uh, Dr. Amit, yeah, yeah, she wanted to say something. Yeah, so, so it has been very interesting. You know, uh, we compared our data of open to tubular. We published two papers, one of them very recently accepted in Asian Spine Journal, where we saw the dural tear and everything. And now, and so we have those data with open and we have those data with the tubular. And now after discarding our learning curve of five, first of 40, 50 cases, we are doing a direct randomized control trial and Atif is one of the principal researcher. And we know our, we can go back and look at our open and we have almost some 450 cases with the open and tubular. And now with this um, already, I think 30, 40 odd cases when each group is already there. And we're looking at, uh, so it's very difficult. They're looking at a VAS score, but you know, when do you look at that VAS score? When are you looking at the ODS score? That is very important. So we are looking at day one VAS score, day one ODI score. We are looking at CPKMB, CRP, uh, even the satisfaction rate. And at, at a three month and one year post-op MRI, to look at the scarring and fibrosis of the patients. And the result has been very, very encouraging. And uh, Atif is one who is looking at the data. And, uh, you know, and at the, at, at Dr. Rightly, Dr. Banhut said that, uh, like, and if you look at the patient's related outcome, no, don't, if you look at the ODI and VAS at one year, we all know that it doesn't matter. Even the, with the tubular study, what we saw, that it didn't matter. But what, but, but, you know, who remembers what you do at the end of one year? They remember what you did on the day one. That is how the patient remembers you. And that we all know is far better. Those over, all of us has migrated from one technique to other. And we know when you do endoscopy, that day one, they are far better compared to whether you've done a open or interlaminar, open or a tubular. And I think we, we should, we, we will be able to validate it by the end of one year. So. So, so just something I, I was sharing our experience with that. Uh, Dr. Ketan, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, yeah, Varun, if you guys have any other comments uh, on what even uh, Ayush has said with regards to MED or UV. So, uh, Sambhav, uh, as, compared to, as uh, compared to open surgery and minimally invasive and endoscopic surgery, just a couple of days back, I operated a patient who had five, six years back got an open surgery for his L5 S1 level done at some other center. And now he had a disc uh, prolapse at uh, L3, L4. And I did it transforaminally under local anesthesia. So that patient had an experience of an open surgery at some other center and a minimally uh, invasive endoscopic surgery. And he couldn't believe that a surgery had been done on him. So that is the kind of, you know, day one difference uh, what uh, Ayush is saying and Dr. Arun are saying that you cannot uh, at all compare. Otherwise, we would not have been working. Uh, all uh, absolutely. Uh, and absolutely. I mean, uh, to give benefit to our colleagues as well and people who are doing different techniques, uh, transforamal and interlaminal obviously are, again, very, very different. And hence, and since we are on the topic of, um, and, and the talk of interlaminal, um, so just one, one more observation, uh, which based on these papers also and on personal experience, the rightly pointed out by Dr. Arun and Dr. and Dr. Ayush as well that uh, I've also had around uh, six to seven years of experience with discectomies and unfortunately have more than 25 MRIs uh, post four years of these patients. Uh, and we do see, I mean, obviously we've not compared it to the open cases or the tube cases or anywhere else, but the the there is not much of increased degeneration or any, as we said, that like a surgical scar. So rightly named 
uh, these endoscopic surgeries as a surgical strike where you're not doing much of collateral damage. And even a lot of these MRIs have not picked up these patients were actually operated before. So I think only time will tell uh, uh, whether are we doing something correct or is it advantageous or not. And I think we need to collaborate further, uh, all of us together and try and publish more of these things so that you know we, we generate the right kind of atmosphere for uh, now the future generation to get the right techniques into their place since there's so many uh, different techniques available and that's what even Masab is trying to do. We had the stand to stock, we have this, hopefully soon will be UB, transfer terminal, etc. So uh, the younger crowd, the younger generation gets to know what, you know, they, they have their all all the choices available for them to okay. decide as to what topics to, yeah. Hello? Sorry. I thought someone was, uh, wanted to, uh, anyone has any other inputs at all? So, Sambhav, I'm here. So, I think yeah. basic, basically there are two aspects of surgery. Number one, taking care of the current issue. And secondly, probably taking care of the future issue, you know. So, I think all the techniques are uh, well-versed with the, taking care of the current issue. Now, the issue is that how much of the prophylactic work need to be done. Now, there are two aspects of the prophylactic work. One, you you do more of the decompression, you do more of the phlebectomy, you kind of... Uh, the, uh, do medial facetectomy and you you know like the old technique and maybe somewhere in between to prevent that uh, any further recurrence from the ongoing degeneration. Now this ongoing degeneration whether it is happening because of the magnitude of the surgery you did or whether it is the it is the nature of the thing means it, it's going to happen uh, uh, because of the aging process. So if it is going to happen because of the magnitude of your surgery, then obviously you are, uh, I think you are doing good by doing, uh, by taking the minimalistic approach. But if you are uh, doing a targeted surgery and the degeneration is happening and it's going to happen with the aging process. And to some extent, you know, like I had a patient, I did uh, left side decompression because the patient had left side symptoms only. Three months later, patient started having right side symptoms and the patient was very, very unhappy that doctor, why didn't you take care of my right side? I said, that time you had left side symptoms. This is not, I mean, now unfortunately in this case, it was same level, you know. So I I even couldn't say that uh, this is a different level, you know, like though it was a different side, but I couldn't say different level. So these kind of things, you know, like where in the recurrence is, uh, I think one of the major criteria which will determine which kind of surgeries are better. And I think, uh, as you said, time only will tell. But but one thing is certain that approach-related uh, collateral damage, which probably can uh, lead to instability and uh, uh, kind maybe accident or degeneration, that obviously will be prevented by these uh, uh, by these uh, minimal like least invasive techniques. Um, thank you, Amit, for those comments, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, for removing your time and being here for this session. Uh, it was uh, really uh, a lot of learning points. Um, and I think the most important thing is that your, uh, our purpose is not to uh, say which technique is better than the other. Um, uh, in fact, uh, our main purpose is that we tell the audience, we tell the members of Mishab that there are various techniques available uh, however, that doesn't mean if you are endoscopic surgeon and don't know how to do general, uh, open surgery or MED, you need to have everything on your, uh, you know, on your resume. You should be able to do everything. There should be ways out. Uh, complications should be dealt with uh, perfectly. And in the end, the patient has to get better. Uh, and uh, Misab will soon be coming with various other topics as well, right from UB to transfer terminal and uh, Dr. Arvind Kulkarni uh, will be uh, uh, conveying all these to us in the future. Uh, so thank you very, very much for giving your time, uh, especially a lot of our colleagues who don't do interlaminar, but still were ready to be a part of this topic and uh, being at the line of fire. But thank you so much for your time. And uh, it was a pleasure. And with that, Neeraj, I think we'll uh, conclude this meeting. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sambhav. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.